It was the heart of it all, so to speak. It was the very dwelling and resting point, the place whereby God met the children of Israel. And so here we realize that chapter 7 brings us a bit of a turn within our language, a conjunction causes us to realize that something must be going on in chapters 5 and 6. Because 7 starts off with the word and. It allows us to recognize that there is something going on from the previous statement or chapter. And so we realize that there's something, there's some backstory here. The backstory, if you will, very quickly, is the fact that the Israelites, the people that were supposed to be people of God, started playing games with God. Uh, they, they decided that they would play the hokey pokey with God. They, they put their right foot in, but they left the rest of themselves out. They put the left foot in and they took it out. And so they were kind of in and out with God, and they had some other gods on the side. They had some issues. And then they decided at some point in time that they would even use God as if God were some type of ATM machine. And so they thought that because in one instance they had the covenant with them, that they could win the battle and yet they lost it. We find out that there are times when you can have God as your protector and God will yet let you know, I know that you're not with me. God is looking for us to be genuine with God. They lost the Ark of the Covenant because they were not where they should be with God. And so uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant ended up in the hands of the Philistines. And it ended up not only in the hands of the Philistines, but the Philistines housed the Ark in a chamber with another one of their gods. God showed his power because several times... The history gives us to know that that other statue continued to fall and bow to our God. Interesting how oftentimes we lose track of where God wants us to be. And not only do we lose track, we later find out, don't worry, I may just leave it. Leave it, there's notes in that. Yeah, you don't have that over there, okay? Look on panel five, it's all that. You have to fill in the blank. All right. You all still fill in the blank, can't you? Yes. All right. We haven't always had media. We haven't always had paper for bulletins. You used to have to remember all this to yourself. And then my grandma would buy but had writings all through it because she had to write notes in the Bible. And so are there any bulletins left? No bulletins left. All right. Well, then that means there's a whole lot of folk here this moment. The fact is, oftentimes what happens is we lose track and we lose sight of where God wants us to be. They lost sight and they lost track of where God wanted them to be to the extent that they allowed the symbol of God to be captured by a heathenistic people. I wish I had you because, you know, the fact is uh, that may seem like it's far off from us, but the fact is we have oftentimes traded the presence and the power of our God for the presence of another type of idol. Well, what do I mean? Some of us are chasing after idolistic kinds of things through our materialism. There are some who are in the rat race because they've become rats to race. They want more. They want to can more. Get all they can and set on they can. You want as much money and the right kind of shoes and the right kind of house, the right kind of car, the right kind of prestige. And oftentimes, we are willing to give up God for the other stuff. And what happens over time is we begin to become unconscious and worship the very things that God has given us rather than the God who gave it to us. Yeah, they got to a point where they allowed those other folks' culture to, to seep in on them and they began to believe what the other folk around them were saying. You know, that is the problem. You know, I don't normally say a whole lot about certain things, but I think you need to realize this morning that part of the issue that we're having as black folk. This is a predominantly African American church. Those who 
come to this church who don't consider themselves African American, they're honorary members, they black too. <laughs> the fact is, that I, I just want to let you know that oftentimes the problem with us as black folk is we've been willing to let go of God. It's the problem with us today is that we want to be so much like other folk that we're beginning to let go of God. For the first time, we've gotten to a place where it seems that we no longer have the kind of reverence uh, by and large that we ought to have for God. There was a time my grandparents would talk about certain crimes that would come on TV and they'd say, well, that's not black folks. Because most of the time you could determine what we did and what we didn't do. And now we have become disrespectful. We've become entitled as if God owes us something. As if God uh, should do something just because we've been in the struggle so long. But the fact is, we've got to get back to a place where God is most important to us. People are trying to figure out how to deal with guns and how to deal with black on black crime and how to deal with police shootings and all of that. The way to deal with anything is to get back to God. And the further we get away from God, the more mess we're going to have. If you want to be like the other folk, you'll realize that they've always had struggles and troubles, and they've always fought against each other and so on and so forth. And now we've got to get to a place where we're not so much caught up in the stuff. Yes. Families yes. need to get back yes. together. Churches need to get back together. We need to stop all this hell that we're doing with each other. Uh -huh. Because how are you going to move forward if you can't at first realize that God is the one that's doing anything for us? Yes. Churches fight against churches. This one got a bigger steeple and that one got a bigger budget. Who cares how big your steeple is when your people are dying? The Bible says that where there is no vision, the people will perish. It doesn't, you know, people think that it's vision just because somebody says we need to build a bigger church. That's not the vision he's talking about. See, sometimes you need to clean your glasses and turn your TV off because our vision is the wrong stuff. You're watching 10, 6, and 4. What he's saying is that we need to remain focused on him because he says that if we will seek after him and his righteousness, all other things will follow you got to learn to get back to God, church. The Israelites had forgotten God. They had started to get, get, get on to this earth, and they wanted to be like other people. I fear that even in the church, even as I talk to our young people, I talk to some of our young people, and let me tell you, many of you, many of you, not all of you, but many of you are settling for what the world tells you is right. And I will tell you today that you need to get back to God. And wrong is still wrong and right is right. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot turn wrong and right on each other. You have to decide either you will follow God or not. There is no such thing as half God and half something else. It's not the world said this, but God says this. And I'm sure that God will agree with the world. It doesn't work like that. We've got to get back to God. And what he says. Yeah. So how do we do that? Number one, let me show you there in the text. It says that when these men came, they fetched the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadad in the hill. And they sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in kijath Jerem that the time was long. For it was 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented after God. Well, the first thing you got to do is don't let your relationship get stale. Right. Don't let your relationship get stale. They got to a place where they just had the ark sitting. Mm -hmm. They weren't worshiping like they ought to. Mm -hmm. They didn't give the kind of respect that they ought to. And the relationship got stale. The text says that we've got to stir up the gift that is within us. Far too often our relationships are stale not only with God but with each other. We've gotten to a place where we uh, believe in individualism. Where we believe that one uh, has to work and be on his own and that success is tied to you and you alone. This whole idea of somebody saying, I can fix all the world's problems, is nonsense. That's right. <laughs> the fact is, the answer is in the collective. The fact is, God has made all of us because the answer is in the collective. We are not, I am not the body of Christ by myself. I am the body of Christ in collection with the other saints of God. Yes. 
See, what we've done now is we believe that when a child gets to a certain age, then that means they're grown. Then the child says, I'm grown. I need to go get my own place because I'm grown. Nonsense. The fact is, if you 18 and you still thinking like a 12 year old, then fool, go back in there and sit down until I finish raising you. <laughs> Sometimes we've gotten too into this whole idea that we need to be individuals. Yes. I, hear, I hear young parents now saying, well, you've got to let them have their own personality. Not in my house. <laughs> you adopt the personality that I give you. Far too often, we have allowed things to just move on where we're feeling like we're by ourselves. It takes a village to raise children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a community to be a community. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just a person doing dumb stuff. Okay. Yeah. What would your bathroom look like without a mirror? <laughs> I dare any one of you to go home and take your mirror out your bathroom. What do you think you would look like on a daily basis? Some of y'all would have toothpaste all around your mouth. Look like Sambo. Some folk have be sticking up on this side and so on and so forth. <coughs> Think about a, a, a bathroom without a mirror. Have y'all would have pants unzipped, hair unkept, one contact in, one contact out. The reason why is because you need to be able to see a reflection in order to realize that something is out of whack. Sometimes you need somebody else to tell you yeah. that you look dumb. Yeah. Yeah. We're fighting a fight and losing it at the same time because we're trying to fight on our own without God. Yeah. We'll never win a fight without God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so we can't let our relationship with God get slack. We've got to realize that God is the one who created us and who has saved us. Amen. But not only that, look at 3 and 4. It says, And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away these strange gods and astroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. You know what you need to do? You need to reject backsliding. We need to reject backsliding. This whole idea that you just, you come to God, you leave God. You come to God, you leave God. Hide, go seek with God. Like God is supposed to find you. <laughs> you know, years ago, not that long ago, but some years ago, I used to play hide and go seek with members of this church. <laughs> Russ Smith, I used to notice a person wasn't here and then I called him. They come back. Three Sundays passed. Where they gone? You call them again. They come back. They hear two weeks, then they gone three weeks. They hear four weeks, then they gone five weeks. And it was just high go seek every every time you have to call. Them. Then one day I realized that if I'm the one that's got to motivate you to be here, then there's a problem already. There's something on the inside that ought to be working on the outside yeah, yeah. that motivates you to do what you're supposed to do. Amen. If you're raising your children and you always have to be their voice of conscience, then there's something wrong. Yeah. We've got to get to a place where we realize that backsliding is bad just because it's bad for us. I need God. Amen. I not only Amen. need God, I need God, but I also need you. Yes. I'm glad that the cross isn't just a stick. Uh -huh. Now I suppose it could have been They could have just took the, 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 the vertical part And they could have nailed him through his neck Through his stomach Put both feet together and just nailed him on the stick Hand just been stopped But that's not how it happened There's a vertical and a horizontal axis yes. <clears throat> So therefore we realize that that cross reaches up and down so that we realize that we ought to have a connection between us and heaven. That there is, uh, as Jacob's ladder was going up into the heaven, we ought to realize that God wants us to reach up and down, but not only up and down, reach out. Yes. Yes. Because it is about us being together. And when I don't get to see you, and when we're not together as the people of God, 
then I become weaker. I need you. You need me. We need each other. And when we backslide, not only from the experience of God, but the experience of each other, we'll find ourselves in a weaker point. So what do you do? Number one, notice number two, A. Notice as he says that you need to return. So the first thing you need to do is you need to make a turn. If we've been if we've been away from God, if we've been away from each other, if we've been going in the other direction, the first thing we need to do is turn around. Sometimes, unfortunately, we don't get to use GPS with God. See, a GPS, my GPS reroutes me. No matter how many bad turns and bad moves I make, my, my GPS reroutes me. It brings me around the way. But Christ says there's only one way. He said to the Father, there's only one way. And that's through me. In other words, you can't take a detour. You can't use the back streets. You need to turn around and head back toward God. And so we've got to be willing to return to God. Then also, it is not a question in terms of God turning toward us. It is us turning toward God. God has already turned toward us. He created us. He created you. He wakes you up in the morning. There's blood running warm in your veins. And for all of that, we all realize that he's already done more than enough for us. Yes. And so we need to return to him. He says you need to return unto the Lord with all your hearts. You need to be wholehearted. To be, you need to be wholehearted. You know we wholehearted for so many things, but not for God. Yeah. Sister Lisa and Deacon David Hodge. If, if the sermon go too long on a Steelers football day or a Cowboy day, they move the game up to noon and some people don't even want a DVR. I got to be there to watch it on TV live. And sometimes we can be greater fans for so many other things. And we miss out on where God wants us to. We can shout. Will you imagine I've never been to church like I've been to an OSU football game? What I mean by that? I go to an OSU football game, Sister Peaches, 95,000 people in the stadium, and you can't hear the person talking beside you. When there's a touchdown, people jump up, they sing songs together, and they don't matter, it doesn't matter how corny it is. I mean, people talk about church, talk about we got to sing them hymns. But then they go down there to the horseshoe and say, hang on, sloop. <laughs> we need to turn and we need to be wholehearted about this thing. Amen. To the point where I'm sold out for what God has for my life and what I'm doing. All this other stuff really doesn't matter. Not only that, look, look at 3 and 4. It says that we need to do that. But he said to put away strange gods. Put away strange gods. Put away all of that strange stuff. And so what we need to do is we need to reject some strange ideas. We need to reject some strange ideas. People come up with all kinds of stuff. The church is a changing place. I've seen people now dancing. I heard, I heard, I watched it for myself. A church had Prince playing in the sanctuary. While people from that generation were dancing down through the aisle. How in the world? I had a couple one time wanting to get married in this church. And they came and they said, uh, when we come down the aisle, we want to play KC and JoJo. <laughs> I said, no, you won't be playing KC and Joe jo here. Now, you get married somewhere else, you can play KC and JoJo all you want to. They had a little uh, wedding coordinator from outside church. And she looked at me and she told them, she said, he's being difficult. <laughs> and I looked at the, uh, I didn't look at her, I looked at them and I said, if y'all want to get married somewhere else, y'all ask her to find your place. And they went back in the back and they shut her up and they come on in there and got married. The fact is, oftentimes we've got too much mixture 
in the church. There's, there's no clear definition and there's no clear lines between the world and us. When we start looking like the nightclub, there's a problem. Yeah. When we sound like the nightclub and we throw in money like we're throwing it at strippers in a nightclub, I don't dance on a pole. <laughs> in the church, you put your money in the tray if you're going to give something, but don't you dare come up here and think I'm going to back it up for you to put a one in my pocket. <laughs> We need to reject some strange ideas that come in the church in order for us to have more people and to be more whatever they want to be. But the fact is, if you really want to get back to God, we've got to reject some strange ideas and embrace only the things of God. Look at verse 5. It says this. It says, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel together, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. We need some prayer partners. We need to get a prayer partner. Amen. There's power, Sister Mason, in prayer. We need people who's praying for us, and we need to be praying for other people. Prayer changes things. Faith is the key. And you realize that the Lord will continue to bless us when we pray together. Because our prayers is communication with God. And when we communicate with God, we, we number one, when we speak to God, we already pronounce faith because it says, I'm speaking to him, so I must believe it. I need to talk to God. And so we need people who are praying for us and with us. Verse 6, he says this, And they gathered together to Mishpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day. And there uh, they said, We've sinned against God. Hmm. You need to clean up. They, they need to, you need to clean up. There was some dirty water that needed to be pulled out and some clean water that needed to be brought forward and some things that needed to be cleaned up. We need to clean up. It's never too late to say, you know what, Lord? I realize that I'm in a bad situation and I need to clean some things up in my life. Yes. There are some folk that need to go home today. They need to clean some things. There's some folk that you left somebody in the bed when you came to church. You need to go home and serve an eviction note. Some people that need to go through their phone log and through their contacts. And there's some folk that you need to not only delete the conversation, but block the next one. There are some things that you need to clean up in your life. There are some, some top papers that need to probably be put away. Yeah. Some shells. I know. My old folks use tops and my new folks use shells. And some of the old folks that think they're young folks using shells too. There's some things that we need to clean up in our lives that cause us to make bad decisions. If it makes you make a bad decision and it draws you away from God, it's time to cut the credit card up because you can't handle it no more. It's time to evict some things out of your life in order for you to focus on God because the debt and the stress and all of that is tearing you up. Yes. And there you are now, second, third, fourth, and fifth job trying to make it. Some things you need to change in your life, some things that need to be cleaned up. There's some situations that you need to go and handle because if you keep on letting it keep on, it's going to tear you up and it may be the very death of you. Look at verses 7 and 8. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mitzvah, the lords of the Philistines went up against it. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us. Hey, number three, I said you need to get a prayer partner for some time. And number five, you shouldn't be afraid to get more prayer. Because you can't use enough prayer. Sister Mag Wood, you need even more prayer. If the first time you feel like you didn't get a connection, maybe you need to talk to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But I need people praying for me. I need folk that are willing to pray. You need folk that are willing to pray. And sometimes when you get in a situation, you can't be afraid to ask somebody to pray for you. That's right. Church, we've got to realize that prayer is so important. But not only is prayer important, it tells us in 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered his burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And he cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. 
Notice he didn't go empty-handed. He brought an offering and he said to the Lord, I'm crying for somebody else, not for myself, for Israel. The Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with great thunder on that day. And he kind of confused them and bothered them. Set them off of their path. The fact is, you've got to realize that you've got to worship through the struggle. Samuel, even though they were going through something, even though there were issues going on, even though they were scared, Samuel realized they still needed to acknowledge God. See, sometimes what happens is when times get tough in our life, Brother Jay Sean, we begin to turn from God. God isn't worth our time anymore because it seems like I'm going through a tough time. Samuel said, look, I'm going to offer up an offering to God. I'm going to give toward the Lord. I'm going to put my attention toward God and I'm going to pray even though we're struggling. See, church, it's easy for us to say thank you when it seems like God has given us something. But see, sometimes, Sister Green, it's difficult to struggle through the pain and to worship when we're at our lowest point. But see, what we see here is that they're willing to even worship and acknowledge God even at the low point. See, it matters if you can worship God even when you don't feel like it. It matters if you can worship God even when it seems that the chips are down. It matters that you can worship God and you know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings because you realize that he died on the cross of Calvary and sometimes life is going to be like that. It seems like all has been lost, but hold on. Worship God even through the struggles, through the trials, through the tribulation, through the bills and through the short resources and through the relationships that seem like they're failing. Still worship God. Still thank Him and praise Him for what you got, but you still got something left. So we got to worship Him through the struggle. But then look at verse 12. Verse 12 says that Samuel took a stone and he set it between Mitzvah and sin and called the name Ebenezer saying hitherto hath the Lord helped us the fact is Samuel realized that the Philistines had been defeated at one time it seemed like all hope was lost it seemed like the Philistines had them it seemed like the Philistines were going to win this thing at one point in time they were afraid they were scared but finally when they saw the Lord show up because he may not show up when you want him brother Leron but he shows up right on time and so he showed up and God 